Woodhouse Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram is bringing you more power, capability, and savings with the full lineup of new Ram trucks during the Black Friday sales event going on all month long. Lease a 2024 Ram 1500 Crew Cab Bighorn for $429 per month. Visit our two convenient metro locations in Blair or Bellevue or online anytime. Lease for 42 months, 10,000 miles per year with approved credit. Tax title license extra. $2,500 down plus first payment and $299 dock fee to its signing. Example stock number BC230242. Offer expires 1130-2023. See dealer for details. Welcome to Rogue Media Network. You have a vision, and we can help you broadcast it. With over 150 podcasts distributed locally, nationally, and internationally, we pride ourselves in delivering high-quality professional content that's filled with humor, information, and entertainment. Are you an avid podcast listener? Discover relatable and reliable shows that cater to a plethora of tastes and interests. From enlightening discussions to lighthearted banter, there's something for everyone. And here's the best part. You can start your own show with Rogue Media Network. We specialize in providing a platform to amplify diverse voices and perspectives, making sure everyone gets a chance to be heard. So why wait? Tune into our podcast and explore a world of ideas and stories, or step up and let the world hear yours. Call us today at 254-300-7982, visit us at roguemedianetwork.com, or send us an email at hello at roguemedianetwork.com. Join the podcast revolution with Rogue Media Network today. Wine and Crime contains graphic and explicit content which may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. You are listening to Wine and Crime, the podcast where two friends... (laughs) Chug wine, <laughs> but not chat true crime. <laughs> yes, and unleash their worst Minnesotan accents. Wow, some kind of accent today is gonna be a today's gonna be a thick one. Oh, it's <laughs> like molasses of the tip of the tongue. Oh, like a crawfish and a butter ball. Hotter than a bucket of butter and a crawfish ball. <laughs> <laughs> I choke on my own accent. It's hard to do. It's It really gets in the throat. It's like a full body yeah. <laughs> expression. Exactly. Anyway, I'm Amanda. <laughs> I'm Lucy. <laughs> and uh, we're here. We're here doing another episode. And I'm very, very, very excited about it. Lucy, do you want to introduce what our topic today is? Well, today we have a very special fan pick. By the one and only Dina Della Cerda. Oh, Dina Della Cerda, Dina Della Cerda. Ba, 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 ba. I hope I said your last name right. Well, yeah, you sent us a pronunciation guide for the first name, <laughs> but not the complex last name. That's okay. Dino, Dina D will forgive you. We but do. Dina D has selected the topic of deep, deep South crimes. Deep, deep. Real deep, like specifically the deep of Texas, the little dip. Oh, well, that's not where my case comes from. So that's where mine is. So it's fine. We're good. We covered all of our bases. (laughs) Barely. That note I didn't read. And even if I had read it, probably wouldn't have taken it. No, no. Because I'm me and I'm going to do me. You will misunderstand the assignments. And that's okay. Yeah, I love it. Case come up with something good. Oh, oh, my case today is so <laughs> males. <laughs> Mine's real dark, which uh, fits because I'm reading Kenyon's case. Always, <laughs> always. My case is dark, but like really old. Okay. So we can still laugh about it. Yeah, we can kind of poke at it because it's from like the land before Helen. Oh. The deep. Deep South. That's old. Yeah. The way, way back. The way, way back machine. Well, before we get started, I have a little anecdote that I've been waiting to tell you on the oh, air. Oh, yes. Because- Lucy texted me earlier and said, don't let me forget to tell my embarrassing story at the top of the show. And I almost forgot. So I'm really glad that you remembered because I have I, ADHD. I'm I've been waiting to tell this. And I really hope that the person affected... Or somebody who knows the person affected will be listening so that I can try to make things right. What did you do? (laughs) Oh, my God. 
Okay, so last weekend. No. So this was Labor Day weekend. Uh, I believe it was Friday night of Labor Day weekend. Okay. I was in Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, uh, that's right, because you took your little mini vacay with your with your buddies, your buddies. Yep. Took okay. a little road trip, clear up to Door County. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. It was great. Love it. Did go to House on the Rock. Duh. Have you been? No. Do you know what it is? No. Google it. It is oh, indescribable. Wait. Yes, I do, because I think that this house, is, this roadside attraction is featured in a book I'm reading right now called American Gods by Neil Gaiman. So, yes, I do know what it is. Is it okay. like a what a really weird house full of like a bunch of tchotchkes and there's like allegedly the world's largest carousel inside of it? The yeah. world's largest indoor carousel. Indoor yeah. carousel. Yep, 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 yep. I know what it is. I have not been. I love confirming that this is a real place. It's a real place, and it's probably even more horrifying in person than even Neil Gaiman can make Amazing. it. Amazing. I love it. I love it. So anyway, we're in Madison, and we're walking to dinner, mm-hmm. and our route happened to take us right past the state capitol. Beautiful Great. state capitol in Madison. Mm-hmm. There's like sweeping marble staircases up four sides of it, like all around the rotunda. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And we're walking past, and I see two people at the top of the stairs. Oh, and you the, did not. <laughs> so, well, the guy gets down on one knee. No, you didn't. <laughs> and I go, and I was like, oh my God, that guy's proposing. So I pull out my phone, thinking that want I'm going to be. Want one all together? Want one all together. <laughs> Do you want one all together? Oh, no. Taking pictures. And I think they're really good pictures. And then I, after she says yes and they hug and whatever, I ran up to the bottom of the stairs and I was like, oh, my God, congratulations. I'm getting all your pictures for you. Oh, my God. Don't leave. I need to airdrop them to you. Oh, no. (laughs) And the guy goes, you're good. I have a photographer. (laughs) And I turn around (laughs) there's a person with like a really long lens you're probably right fucking behind me you're probably lurking in like every shot of their engagement they have to photoshop you out I fucked it up and so then i just screamed oh fuck and ran away i ran Lucy. i'm sweating just thinking about it they're gonna remember you for the rest of their life and the when fucking they tell- dick who ruined their <laughs> The guy was probably like, you motherfucker. You creep. I thought I was saving the day. No, honey, you were ruining the day. (laughs) (laughs) The pictures are really good, though. Uh, Send them to me. I want to see them. (laughs) I'm going to send one to you right fucking now. I want to see. And the the girl's like all happy and flustered, and the guy's just like, "Mm." get away from us. I'm not letting you airdrop me anything. <laughs> Wait, Bye. I have to airdrop them. T- I need your number. Okay, that is just gorgeous. Get close enough. Did you get the picture? Yeah, and it's a also good they, they're looking right at you. I like, know because I screamed. Oh, congratulations! <laughs> so anyway, if that, you're out there listening, congratulations, congrats, and also, and I need to. I need, I need to, to airdrop you these I still need to get you these photos. Look how oh red I am. You're so red. I don't get embarrassed very easily. This was definitely top three oh embarrassing moments God. of my life. I w- I, mostly I want to <laughs> find them so we can post this to the Wine and Crime account and congratulate them. But yeah, wow. It's gorgeous. What a great spot to propose. It was also, beautiful. She totally knew it was coming. You made her climb all those stairs with no one around. Come on. <laughs> it's not like it she was open. Knew. It was yeah. like 7 p.m. on a on a set on a mm, Friday. She knew. I mean, worth it. These pics are stun. She's so cute. Oh wow, my well, god. Well, congratulations. Congrats. Sorry, Lucy. Feel free to email screamed us. at you. <laughs> I'll get you these photos. Because oh I think god. they're pretty good. Oh my god. <laughs> anyway. Oh, you're the worst. I just had to put that out there. Oh, that's so funny. You just, you literally, like, ruined someone's engagement photos. <laughs> Thank I don't God even for want Photoshop. to know how much he paid for that personal <laughs> photographer. 
Holy uh, shit. I want to see the o- the originals with your little head just like in the <laughs> corner. Get closer. <laughs> all together. While we're all together. Oh my god. Wow. So Congratulations. Hot. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. And congratulations. That's amazing. Oh my god. Okay. I got to I have to drink or something. Great. Then should we get to my <laughs> wine and cr- wine yes. crime pairing? Yes, for the love of god, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you might really need what Dina recommended after that experience. (laughs) So (laughs) Dina requested that I drink Corona and a shot of Cuervo because this is apparently like what they love in that southern tip of Texas, deep in the heart of Texas. (laughs) I had Hornitos Reposado on my bar, so that's what I have a shot of. I was not about to go buy Jose Cuervo. No, you're 35 years old. I'm 35 years old. It it wasn't happening. I'm (laughs) sorry. So I have that. And I rarely ever drink beer. So I also did not run out and buy Corona, though I really could have just like bummed one from my future father-in-law. Shout out to Tom, because (laughs) on the rare occasion that he does have a beer, he's a Corona man. That's his go-to. Ice cold (laughs) Corona man. Corona man. That's what he likes. He does. <laughs> I also popped a gummy, so this is going to get weird. Oh, fuck yeah. Tequila causes me f- severe physical pain. Mm-hmm. And I poured a healthy shot. You're going to take one for the team, baby. I'm going to try. My mouth is already watering. <laughs> ha. So I'm not going to be able to find any of these tasting notes that I looked up, but like allegedly, this has <laughs> tasting notes of balanced agave. With apple, I'm smelling it, I'm sorry, with apple and herbal (laughs) notes, and that it's slightly woody and is a medium to full-bodied spirit with warm, slightly astringent finish. That's like a mouthwash word. Yeah, with that, like, the the astringent component is probably all I'll be able to taste. Yeah. From here, it kind of smells like paint thinner. Do you want me to do a shot with you in solidarity? I kind of do. I'll help if, you. If you're up for it. I'm up for it, baby. All right. Do you need to go get one or do you have one? No, I'll go get it. I'll okay, be so great. fast. You got a whole setup. You're smart. I didn't grab a chaser, but I'm too comfortable <gasps> to get up. So we're just going to do it. I got a cran pineapple juice back. <laughs> that sounds so good. Okay. It's pretty good. Here we go. To to Dina and to the deep, deep south. Dina, you owe us. Just kidding. You've paid your dues. (laughs) (coughs) I have to... I didn't finish it all. That's okay. My mouth. (laughs) Is it astringent? Ah! Did you get notes of apple and herbal notes? Sure did it. (laughs) Is it slightly woody? Oh, God, you went back. Uh. Ah! <laughs> Tequila is not in my wheelhouse. It really never it. has been. I nailed it. You fucking crushed. Oh, my eyes are watering. Ugh. Okay. Anyway, the lengths we go to. Yep. <laughs> um, Lucy, <laughs> what's our background in <laughs> psych, maybe psych? Oh, you and I are the only psych in this For deep, deep, deep my mouth won't stop watering. <laughs> I'm so sorry you didn't have a chaser, but also, what the fuck? It's <coughs> it's my own fault. Yep. Oh, you're burping it up, aren't you? I'm fine. Oh, everything's fine. <laughs> oh, God, I'm burping it up. I don't even burp. Don't talk about it. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> the deep south, also known as the lower south is a cultural and geographic subregion in the southern United States. Oh, God. Most definitions include Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Texas and Florida are sometimes included due to being just, like, peripheral states mm-hmm. because they both have coastlines with the Gulf of Mexico, mm-hmm. a history of slavery, large African-American populations, and they were part of the historical Confederate States of America. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Regionally, however, it's mostly East Texas and North Florida that okay. kind of have those deep South characteristics. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sometimes Tennessee is included due to its reliance on slavery and cotton, as mm-hmm. well as Arkansas, really is just due to Arkansas's location. 
What okay. about Louisiana? Oh, I said Louisiana. Oh, you did. Okay, okay, okay. Because I think that's... I did. You did. You did. You did. Yep. I see it now. So that's Louisiana, my Mississippi, case. Alabama, Alabama Georgia, case, South Carolina. Place. A L A B A M E. Every time I see the word, first of all, every time I write the word Mississippi, I spell spell it out. Same. And also, every time I see the word Alabama, I think of the part in Forrest Gump. Oh. He's like, I'm from Alabama! <laughs> or whatever he says. He just shouts Alabama, and it's really cute. <laughs> Amazing. <sighs> so uh, fun. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I interrupted you. Where were we? Arkansas Got is it. basically just thrown in there because why not? Yeah, it's right there. Essentially, the Deep South consists of the states that seceded and started the American Civil War. Okay. Uh, because of their cu- cultural and economic reliance on slave labor. Mm-hmm. In fact, the term Deep South was first used to describe exactly that, the states, the states most dependent on plantations and slavery prior to the Civil War. Mm. Although prior to the Civil War, they called it the Lower South, not really, mm-hmm. the, not really the Deep South. Mm-hmm. Following the war, the region suffered economic hardship, no shit. Yeah. And was a major site of racial tension during and after the Reconstruction era. Before 1945, the Deep South was often referred to as the Cotton Belt Mm. or also the Black Belt. Mm. Mm. Since cotton was the primary cash crop for economic production. The civil rights movements in the 1950s and 60s helped to usher in a new era, sometimes referred to as the New South, Mm because we love a good rebrand. Yeah. Particularly in this case. We love a good whitewashing. (laughs) God bless. Well, it's important that we not forget, but also crucial that we move forward. A thousand percent. The New South. So that's really my background as far as the Deep South is concerned. Mm -hmm. Also, I intentionally kept this a little bit short because... I'm pulling double duty today because I'm reading Kenyon's case, too. Yep, yep. But before I get to that, I have some fun facts for us about the South in general. Okay. And this is from bestlifeonline.com. I love your fun facts. Also, does this mean there's no psych? There's no psych. Shh, where are your bones? Oh, fuck. Somebody got a, a, a couple listeners got bone, but. Jar of bone matching tattoos. They super did. That was so cute. It's so cute. And you can't not shake the bones for them. Well, I'm going to shake Kara's or uh, Kayla's bones again. Fabulous. Those big bones. There's no psych. Yeah, there's a tooth in there. Oh, yeah. There's some vertebrae. Love. There's a variety. Okay, here we go. No psych, baby. I like. Thank you, Kayla, again for the bones. Kayla also sent us some creepy dead jewelry <gasps> that I need to get to you. Oh. Mm-hmm. Real cute. Yes. Actually, I have one of them right here. Show me, show me, show me, show me, show me. Okay, we got Ooh. some sort of bone keychain. It kind of looks like bacula, like a penis bone. But it's not curved. I know. I know. It might it's be. Too, it's, it might be too straight. Also, uh, if you are loving this riveting audio content, <laughs> just think of how great it would be on. What is that? A little gator foot? Yeah. Oh, it's a I lizard. Need it. But its toenails Her are painted nails red. Are painted. I need it. <laughs> I need it. I don't know what's in your package. It might be different. Oh, damn it. And then I also have clip on because I don't <gasps> have pierced ears. Lock. Some sort of mandible. I think they're squirrel mandibles. Oh, my God. Those are so fucking cool. Yeah. I want to know mine. I got to come visit you so I can get my package. Yeah, honey. I'm mm. holding it. I'm holding it hostage. Yes. Okay. Fun facts. Yes. Despite the Civil War ending more than 150 years ago, a woman named Irene Triplett of North Carolina is still receiving a monthly pension check in no. the amount of $73.13 for the Civil War from the Department of Veterans Affairs. She's the only person still alive to be receiving. Who was on this list. Wow. Triplett, who just turned 88 recently, is the daughter of Confederate soldier Moses Triplett, who deserted right before Gettysburg and died in 1938. Ugh. Okay. So I don't well, know, like... Enjoy maybe your Confederate blood money. Yeah, your $73 a month. Yeah. I don't know. What, the, is it just your direct children that get checks like that and not like... It must be. I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah, I thought that was kind of weird. Okay, next fact. There's an island in South Carolina where only monkeys are allowed. 
What? Are there any monkeys there currently? Sure are. After a group of monkeys at the Caribbean Primate Research Center in Puerto Rico became infected with an outbreak of herpes B. I don't know what herpes B is. Sending locals into a mild panic. (laughs) This is very well written. The state of South Carolina swooped in to save the day by offering up an empty island where the infected primates could go live. Oh, for God's sakes. Now, Morgan Island, just north of Beaufort, plays home to more than 3,000 rhesus monkeys. What? But you're not allowed to visit. The land is owned by the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources and protected under federal law, and the monkeys themselves are under the jurisdiction of the FDA for research purposes. That you are not so allowed to go there. fucking weird. It's so fucking weird. It reminds me of Jurassic Park. Yeah. Also, like... I know they're all the same species, like rhesus monkeys, but given enough time, couldn't they make their own, like, weird mutations, like their own I mean, species? probably. I don't know. That's how evolution works. I right? don't know, but uh, hopefully someone's keeping an eye on that island. Because... Maybe they develop a resistance to herpes B. Maybe. I wonder if they meant hepatitis B, because a lot of the stuff in this article was misspelled. Whatever. I... I don't know. I'm going to Google herpes B. <laughs> the herp. Just yes. one herpy. Nothing is coming up. Oh, herpes B virus. Macaque monkey. CDC. Dot oh, gov. Great. It's real. Herpes so, B people. Yeah, it's a real thing. All right. Next fact. If you're ever wondering where the Amish go on vacation. Uh, okay. Yes. They go, they go to Pinecraft, a beach resort neighborhood in Sarasota, Florida. So for nearly a century, Amish families from all over the country travel down to Florida to get a taste of the sunny atmosphere. Huh. Most most are shuttled down in specialized charter buses, and the strict rules of the Amish community are loosened for the sake of a beach vacation. Wow. I was going to say, they allowed to wear buttons, zippers. Probably. I, I have a photo on the drive yes. of a bunch of Amish people standing on the beach. Oh, my and God. Like, it looks Cute. like the ladies still have their socks on. They still have oh, their yeah. bonnets on. Oh, yeah. The guys oh, yeah. are just hanging out with their pants rolled up. Oh, I think their so- the ladies' socks are off. Oh, I hope if so. If you zoom in, it does not. They don't look socked. They okay. don't look besocked. Besocked. <laughs> <laughs> Good, because l- socks on the beach suck. Socks on the beach. Come on, everybody. Come on, all you Amish. (laughs) Socks on the beach. (laughs) So fucking stupid. I I know. know. Really fucking dumb. (laughs) Okay, next fact. Until 2004, it was illegal to get a tattoo in the state of South Carolina. That, 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 that should still be illegal. (laughs) Yep. Says yep. the woman with the most tattoos. What? I didn't get any of them in South Carolina, though. Not yet. Not you a do one. love to get tattoos on vacation. I really do. Not even on vacation, just like while traveling for any reason. For any reason. Any reason at all. Gators okay. are pests. Yeah, gators are pests. <laughs> Big old pests. Big old pests. Did you know that the world's largest drive in restaurant is in Restaurants? Georgia? Restaurant? Wow. Drive, like drive restaurant. in? Like, like where they wear the little roller the skates, little roller skates, and bring a tray to your car. Mm-hmm. Oh my stars! How cute is that? So the vi- <laughs> <laughs> my sorry, this, land, my land, my Atlanta. The Varsity Restaurant is an Atlanta staple as well as a world record holder, a okay. hot spot for fast food since 1928. The world's largest drive-in restaurant can accommodate around six. Hundred cars. Whoa! At one time. Whoa! So it's basically a big ass parking lot with a yeah. big ass like line kitchen. Wow! <laughs> wow! 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 Mm-hmm. North Carolina holds the record for the most American Idol finalists from any state with three. <laughs> ah, that's so weird. I know. <laughs> what the f? So you liked Monkey Island. There's uh, also I near- fear Monkey Island. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with the STIs. It has everything to do with 
an island rhesus only monkeys. inhabited by rhesus monkeys. Thousands. That, <laughs> thousands of them that we marooned there because of something <laughs> we did to them. Like They're every, pissed. Everything about it is the way that the like horror movies start. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, Especially what the my- fuck? My inquiry as well to whether they could create their own species. You know they're gonna, out of spite. They're gonna be resistant oh. to, to anything. They're gonna outlive oh, yeah. humans. Oh, yeah. They're already mad at us. This is it, guys. They're already collaborating. They're fucking monkeys. COVID was nothing. They can plot. COVID <laughs> was nothing compared to what we're in what we're in for here. Monkey apocalypse. Oh God. Woof. Anyway. Well, anyway, next, now that next you know that there's <laughs> Monkey Island, there are also nearly 200 wild horses located on Cumberland Island wild off the coast of horses. Georgia. Go um, and drag me a Well, these ones probably could. They're <laughs> wild and they roam freely around the island, which you can visit, but it's only open to a certain number of visitors per day. So you have to make reservations to go see it. Also, I don't know how eager I would be to visit horse wild, island. wild horse, very strong and probably somewhat reactionary wild horse <laughs> island. I don't want to do any of these things. Why? Okay, keep going. The drive-in. The drive-in I totally want to do. I definitely want to do that. There are, there are things on this list you will want to do. Okay, 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 okay. The next one is not one of them. <laughs> Ah, great. <laughs> In June 2015, a bomb squad had to be dispatched to the University of Alabama. Roll Tide. Oh, Ole Miss. <laughs> Ole Miss. <laughs> After a group of construction workers discovered Civil War era cannonballs under the sidewalk they were repairing. <laughs> Ooh, we got balls, people. So a university spokesperson said at the time, quote, out of an abundance of caution, EOD technicians were called to address any safety issues. Fucking just in case. Because yeah. can you imagine? Well, were cannonballs like stuffed with like gunpowder and shit? I think so. In some cases, maybe not all of them, but. Okay. I didn't know if they just like were heavy balls. <laughs> Which didn't what wouldn't make it? as much sense. Cannonballs contain Civil explosives. War cannonballs, Let's but the the squad ultimately recovered ten total Damn. cannonballs. Yeah. Huh. What you, what are you finding? Oh, it looks like it. it looks like it. Because there's another. Oh no. Uh oh. <laughs> oh. This is from WarHistoryOnline.com, which Ooh. sounds not legitimate as a source no but it's from april of 2020 and the article says civil war cannonball exploded and and killed i don't know how many or who 140 years after it was fired so i guess they can have explosives in them they probably do have some sort of gunpowder in them because it would like, make really sense. what good is just one big heavy ball well right you're more like you're gonna cover more ground you know if it explodes if it also explodes yeah, yeah. Okay. Huh. Look at us. So there there were both exploding shells and non-exploding cannonballs used during the Civil War. This USA Today, which I kind of, I trust a lot more than World History. The, the, Heinz, the Heinz Ketchup History Center blog that also <laughs> posts about it. <laughs> what is the, the internet's amazing. I've definitely cited like the spam website. Oh yeah. Like canned meat spam. Uh-huh. Oh, whatever. Those big corporations. They, they can hire fact checkers. Have, yeah, they clearly have time. Too much time. <laughs> and money. Mm-hmm. Okay, you'll like this one. At one time, there was a bar on the Tennessee-Georgia border. The Florida-Georgia line? Kind of. Except <laughs> Tennessee-Georgia and just okay. the border. Okay. Patrick's Pub and Grill was located in both Copper Hill, Tennessee and McKaysville, Georgia. Oh, it like the bar... Went over like was half on state line, half on the. Whoa, I like yep. that. So if you wanted to drink, you could only drink it on one side <laughs> because McKaysville <laughs> is located in a dry county. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So I don't know the. Per- 
purpose of having any any part of the bar in the Dry County, that's, but there you that's go. That's the best thing I've ever heard. I, I love that so fucking much. Sadly, the bar closed in 2015. No! I don't know how, but it's pretty, pretty amazing. That is brilliant. Yeah, how? Wow. Bring it back. Bring it back. Bring it the fuck back. Losers Weepers. That would be a perfect Losers Weepers spot. Because there'd be losers. On one side. And Weepers. Yeah. Wow. We're but I op- also don't want to operate anywhere near a dry county. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> we are we'll, opening Losers Weepers. We'll workshop it. Yep. Okay, next. Georgia might be known as the peach state, but South Carolina actually harvests three times as many peaches annually. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, like. Oops. Eat that, Georgia, but also <laughs> California produces more than either one of them. So <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> well, California is also but like way bigger. It's not about quantity; it's about quality, and the quality of the Georgia peach. It's a peach is above and beyond the rest. I guess I'm not even a s- peach fan. I would as what. Peaches are so good. Yeah, but you don't really like love sweet things, so I get it. I don't love sweet things. I don't really love fruit. <laughs> <laughs> I like strawberries. I'm not a fruit person. I'm not. I don't like music. I don't like fruit. You don't like music? Not really. Oh, I- Unless it's Alanis. <laughs> I don't like I don't like concerts. I don't like music festivals. I don't like Well, but that's different. Those are like experiences with a lot of overwhelm. You listen to music like in your car and stuff. You you made all of our most like famous mixes in high school. I listen to like NPR in the car. (laughs) I really I don't mean I have to be in a particular mood to want to listen to music. And yeah, I fucking rocked all those mixes. I'm so shocked because (laughs) you were like the vibe curator through very specific like (laughs) formative musical tastes that I have continued to foster as an adult were a like, result directly of our friendship. Like, and you're telling me right now, yeah, but, you're not, yeah, I don't really like music. I, t- I mean, uh, in, as, oh a, as, a, as a broad category, I like very specific music, such as Question Mark and the Mysterians, <laughs> but I, only that one song. I can't. <laughs> I'm too high for this. Okay. <laughs> like, I feel like my childhood is crumbling apart in my hands right now. Well, maybe I liked it more. I almost said back when we were friends. <laughs> <laughs> Before you moved. <laughs> the good old days. The good old back days. when we were. <laughs> Holy shit. You know what I mean. Oh, yeah. Okay. In person. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh okay. my God. We do not have a parasocial relationship. We are her actual. Next fact. This we're, ba- is- <laughs> we're basically married. <laughs> uh, yeah. This is too much. Fucking next. Okay, next. Please. <laughs> uh, I've, got, I've got some good ones coming up. Shit. I mean, they're all good. I think they're good. Okay. <laughs> per one Myrtle Beach ordinance, swearing on Myrtle Beach can net you a fine of up to $500 or up to 30 days in jail. <laughs> <laughs> they, like, Uh-oh. rarely enforce it, but still. <laughs> well, yeah, but if they really wanted to, they could. They definitely could. I well, don't I, like it, that. It said they, like, add it on as, like, a charge if someone's being super disorderly. Okay, that makes sense. But still, 30 Not days, 30 a, days in jail that. for swearing on Myrtle Beach. Don't. Okay. D- okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't love it. Okay. Do not, do not love it. <laughs> you'll like this one. Pe- Pesca, Pascagoula, Mississippi. Pensacola, Mississippi, experienced a string of home invasions during the summer of 1942. But these weren't your normal B&Es. Oh, Instead no. of waking up to lost possessions, townspeople would find locks of their hair missing. Oh! Nicknamed the Phantom Barber, the intruder <clears throat> even once cut hair off of a sleeping six-year-old. What on earth? And they never caught the Phantom Barber. Ick! I know, isn't that gross? I hate that. I know. 
Oh my god. Something okay. you'll love. You're great. I always get a new fucking fear with you. Now <laughs> it's gonna be the Phantom Barber. It's my life's mission. Coming to my house. Well, okay. at least it's not your hair. You can just call I Justin mean, and get it restored. It's still mine. Because <laughs> you bought it. Yeah, I bought it. <laughs> It mine. legally belongs to me. It is legally mine. Oh my god. Okay. Next, there is a next. There is a UFO welcome center in Bowman, South Carolina. Love that. South Carolina resident Jody Pen Pender, Pendarvis okay. ha- has made it clear that his place is the place to be when the aliens finally visit. Finally. The, the unofficial welcome center is makeshift designed to look like two silver UFOs. There's a photo on the drive. So that they'll feel at home. They'll feel welcome. Inside one of the ships, Pendarvis has put a toilet, a shower, a television, and even air conditioning. Everything to make an extraterrestrial visitor feel welcomed. It's exactly what you, it's two shitty looking silver UFO kind of shapes. I love it. And I is it still there? Like, is this a tourist attraction now? It is. You can visit it. The website said prices, like ticket prices vary, but they are never more than $20. Love it. Honestly, money is no object when it comes to the <laughs> UFO Visitor Center. <laughs> I'm I'm here. I just think it. it's funny that the owner, like, shifts the prices <laughs> based on how inconvenienced he would be if someone showed up. Well, probably, or like how much change they have available in the till. If they like can't break a 20, then your ticket is $20. I don't know what to tell you. I'm sorry. I love it. (laughs) Absolutely. That's what I would do. Are you kidding me? Okay. This is another good one. You can find Stonewall Jackson's amputated left arm buried Um, in Virginia. Buried? So Mm -hmm. like if you look hard enough, you could find it or they know where it is. (laughs) No, it's like a grave. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> you could find his left arm buried in Virginia sorry, if you please. look hard enough. Oh my god! The way that was that was written. Give me a break. I, my dinner has been a weed gummy and a sh- giant shot of tequila. <laughs> it's like a triple shot. The fact that I can understand a word you're saying is a miracle. I can't wait for your segment. Okay. Oh, my God. So this you confer- could find it if you look hard. Wow. Oh, I can't, I can't stop crying. Why am I like this? My I don't know. brain makes no sense. Like, who would... Who would get that? I okay. I'm fine. Like you Who? could find it in Virginia <laughs> if you had like a cadaver dog. If you had the shovel. time, if you had the time and resources to search for it, you could find it. Okay, let me explain this further for you. The Confederate general's left arm was amputated near Chancellorsville after he was accidentally shot. By his own troops. You fucking idiot. He was a <laughs> Confederate general. I don't give a well, shit. Well, yeah, I don't give a shit. It's funny as hell. <laughs> fucking friendly fire took him out. <laughs> at the time, he lived, but his arm was laid to rest at the Elwood Manor Cemetery. Fucking the, why? The rest of his body is buried more than 100 miles away in Lexington, Virginia. What the fuck? I hope that piece of shit hasn't rested a day in his afterlife because (laughs) his arm is 400 miles away from the rest of his body. Why would they just... Jesus Christ! I can't hope for that because I have two arms right behind me. And I don't know where the rest of her is. Not that that would be applicable to everyone. That it would just be applicable to him and other equally heinous people. Lori donated her body to science. There you go. Presumably. So she gets to be whole and happy in the afterlife. Yeah. I also talk nice to her. Yeah. She's good. It's like talking to your plants to help them grow. She guards some of my plants. There you go. I don't know if you can see it in the background of this video, but she's guarding my plant in my window. I can't see it, but that doesn't mean it isn't there. Yeah, it's there. If you look hard enough. All right, I got you. I got two more. Like, you could find it? <laughs> like, a person could? I'm fine. God, you are a fucking gem. Okay. 
The deadliest natural disaster in U.S. history happened in Texas. Of course. And actually, the deep It was deep the deep election south. of Ted Cruz. And- <laughs> <laughs> so many casualties. So many casualties. It was ugly. Fuck. <laughs> FEMA comes oh. in. <laughs> <laughs> They're handing out bottled water. <laughs> <laughs> Paper towels. <laughs> Those silver, like, blankets. <laughs> the, like, space blankets. <laughs> so fucking dumb. I'm sorry. <laughs> After Ted Cruz gets elected, everyone's like shivering in the dark. <laughs> oh god. Fuck. Oh my god. Okay. So <laughs> the Great Galveston storm of 1900 resulted oh, no. in an estimated six to eight thousand deaths. Oh. It was a big old disaster after an unnamed hurricane wrecked the golf court. The, go- wow. the golf, golf course. Golf court. Golf court. The golf course. The <laughs> golf coast. The golf. Wow, that's what you were trying <laughs> to say? I was trying to say the golf coast, and I said the golf course. Okay, I'm going to speak directly to our listeners right <laughs> fucking now. Stop having us take shots. <laughs> This is absurd. I know. The golf so, course. So sweaty. Oh, my God. So at the, t- at the time, predictions had the storm going up the East Coast, but it made a hard left and just slammed into Galveston. Oh, my God. Which sits on the barrier on a barrier island in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm. That was left unprepared and unevacuated when the Category 4 hurricane hit. Ooh. With winds surpassing 135 miles an hour. And when was this? Was probably before they had. 1900. Yeah, so they didn't have like emergency alert systems, obviously, at that time. I don't know what they had, but that's the picture of the sideways house that you saw on the drive. Oh, no way. Yeah, I it w- ruined oh, it. That's rough. Mm-hmm. And finally, my last but best fact. Okay. The largest living cat lives in South Carolina. What? A an adult male liger, <gasps> so a cross between a lion and a tiger, named yeah. Hercules, lives at the Myrtle Beach Safari, a wildlife preserve in South Carolina, standing Whoa. at 49 inches tall and 131 inches long no. and clocking in at 922 pounds. There's a point where it- I, and I see this cat on the drive, so cute in pictures. Mm-hmm. But there's also a point where it stops being cute, and then it's just scary. It's and that is so Jurassic. scary. This, this is a, mu- yes, this is like a Jurassic-looking muscle machine of a cat. But of course, not literally Jurassic, because I don't think they had like well, cats yeah. like this then. But still. It's real scary. It's really, really big. Yeah, arguably too big. Hercules is recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest living cat. Reportedly, he eats 20 pounds of chicken or beef every day, which doesn't seem like a lot to me, given how fucking huge he is. Yeah, but a lot of these animals, like, they're they're used to in the wild not eating every day. Mm-hmm. So if they if this is how much they're getting each day, they can't make them, like, fat. Like, they have to, you know, and, like... You know, they can't overfeed them because there's like serious health risks to these animals. Absolutely. But look how fucking cute they have to ration it. That little close up of his big old fluff face is real cute. Really fucking cute. I also saw like a graph that showed a comparison of lions and tigers and then ligers. And bears. And ligers. I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) Lions are the smallest. Yeah. Tigers are like roughly 50% bigger than lions on average. And, and then ligers, ligers are, are massive. Massive. It's so weird. It is weird. It's so weird that they would become so much larger from the the blending of two species that are smaller. Mm-hmm. But Maybe it something. compounds. The size just compounds. Yeah, it I just don't adds. know. Wow. Well, yeah. those fun facts were so fun. Makes me want to go to at least South Carolina to the Myrtle Beach Safari Wildlife Let's fucking Reserve. go. I don't want to go to go. Monkey Island, though. because No, 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 no. I'm too scared of that island. Well, we're no. not allowed to go. Well, good, because it's too scary. So we can hit up the 600 car drive through Great. We can hit up the UFO welcome station. Perfect. And 
Well, the, the bar is closed, so there's no point. And we can buy that property, reopen the bar, and then go home. I do want to find Stonewall Jackson's arm while right. we're there. I want to well, dig I'll, it. I want to dig I'll, it up. I'll start training Callie to be <laughs> the world's oldest cadaver dog. However long it takes. Yeah. I want to find his arm. Great. We're <laughs> on it. Oh, my God. Well All right. done. Thanks. <laughs> Should we hear a quick word from our sponsors and then back to you, Mama Lucy? Yes, let's do it. Fabulous. You know how some footwear is created as like a torture device? <laughs> Yes. Like made to, it seems like some designers go out of their way to give you blisters and like a bleeding toenail. They like never break in. Never break in. You need to wear six pairs of socks with them so that they don't rub. It's just, (laughs) I can't. I will get a cute pair of shoes and then wear them once, be in pain all day, and then they sit in my closet and I don't put them on again. Mm -hmm. Because they hurt too much. Mm -hmm. But you know who doesn't do that to us at all, ever? Because they love us too much and love our feet. Rothy's, okay? Rothy's, a gift from the heavens. These are versatile shoes that are stylish and still feel comfortable. They have this signature seamless knit design that looks and feels amazing right out of the box with no break-in period. And this is a great time to check out Rothy's because transitioning to a fall look is so easy with Rothy's shoes. There are so many colors that work season after season. This is a no-brainer. Tell us more. Uh, I Speaking of seasonal transitions, I just swapped out my summertime Rothy's for my f- more fall tones Rothy's. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like a new person. Yeah, I'm about to put my Mary Janes away and uh, pull out my Chelsea boots. Oh, yeah. Those are so yeah. cute. So there are so many reasons why People Magazine named The Point the best flat for their first ever style awards in 2021. The the Point, imagine like a workplace setting, somewhere you have to Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. look like you have your life together. Right. Those are the shoes. Those are the shoes that you want to be wearing and you look Mm -hmm. so cute. They have so many cute colors and uh, patterns and styles. Every time I log on to the Rothy's website, I find something else that I just absolutely have to have. Same. I love their loafer as well. The loafer's so cute. Mm -hmm. So Such a good fall shoe, too. Yes. And their wide Mm -hmm. variety of styles are great for fall and winter and, frankly, spring and summer. So you'll never have to worry about getting brand new shoes every season. And the best part is that everything Rothy's makes is better for the planet. They've repurposed millions of water bottles into their signature thread that goes into every single one of their products. And it doesn't sound like it would be comfortable, but let me tell you. I don't know how they do it. It's sorcery. They are so comfy. Absolutely. So get stylish shoes that are versatile and durable enough to wear all the time with Rothy's and get $20 off your first purchase at rothys.com forward slash gals. That's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash gals and treat your feet. Trade them. Uh, are you ready for my case? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Full disclosure. I did not write these notes because I don't have fucking time to do yeah. double the workload. Right, right, right. So don't ask me any questions because I don't. Yeah, no, them. it's all good. These are these are Kenyon's notes. These are Kenyon's notes. So we're just filling in for Kenyon, and you are doing the incredibly challenging task of cold reading them because you don't want to know ahead. I don't. And I know. don't want to know ahead. <laughs> so this is like the way we're doing it. It's like a popcorn reading, really. We're our own guest. We have no idea what's coming. Yep. So here we go. We're going in blind. Here we go. Here we go. I love it. Mark Kilroy was born in Chicago on March 5th, 1968. But soon after his birth, his family relocated to Santa Fe, Texas. Ooh, okay. A small town outside of Houston. Mm. That's so funny that there's a Santa Fe, Texas, because... There's... It's everywhere. Santa Fe, New Mexico. It's well known, for sure. But, but you know, uh, there's also, a Springfield in every state. In the contiguous U.S. Well, I'm saying it's funny because just a couple weeks ago on our road trip, my friend Shad said, my favorite city in Texas is Santa Fe. And we were all like, (laughs) idiot. (laughs) He definitely meant Austin. Oh. But he said Santa Fe. But no, Shad, if you're listening, which 
you fucking better be. <laughs> you're a little bit validated here. <laughs> oh my god, you're so scary. I love it. I okay, like to Santa intimidate Fe. my friends. <clears throat> <laughs> Mark, alongside his brother Keith, was raised to be a devout Catholic by his father Jim, a chemical engineer, and his mother Helen, a volunteer paramedic. Okay. Throughout his childhood, Mark was an excellent student who also excelled at sports and particularly basketball. He's a b-ball mm, boy. Okay. Basketball is where he met his three closest friends, Bill Huddleston, Bradley Moore, and Brent Martin. Bill, Brad, Bill Bradley, Brent. and Brent. Bill, Bill Brad, Brad Brant. Brant. <laughs> Bill and, Brad and Brant. And Bill Mark. Brad Brant and Mark. <laughs> In the words of a 1989 Texas Monthly article, quote, all four boys, young men actually, were tall, athletic, and clean cut. None of them used drugs. All okay. were serious students. I know, right? Okay. okay. <laughs> all were serious students. They were the kind of boys you'd like your daughter to date and marry, and Santa Fe was the sort of place where you'd like your grandkids to grow up. Okay, projection, Texas Monthly. Right. That was It was 89. Also, Texas Monthly is a great publication. <laughs> Truth. After high school graduation, all four boys decided to stick close to home. Mark enrolled in Southwest Texas State University before transferring to Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas, on a basketball scholarship. That could also be Tarleton and Stephenville. I don't fucking know. However, I'm nailing it. However, (laughs) he decided eventually to give up his athletic ambitions and transferred again, this time to the University of Texas at Austin, a.k.a. Santa Fe, to become a pre-med student. Throughout all of these changes, he remained close friends with Bill Brad and Brent. (laughs) In March of 1989, the four decided to take a spring break vacay to Mexico, as you do. Spring break. They drove nine hours to the border town of Brownsville, Texas, where they had rented a hotel room and checked in around midnight. Mm. Nine hours. Mm -hmm. Texas is too fucking big. Yeah, Texas is huge. It's kind of wild. Yeah. But like, California would take... Fucking two days to drive all the way up the coast of California. Would it take two days? I mean, probably not like 48 hours, but that's probably closer to 15 to 20 hours of a drive. Yeah. Well, I could probably do it in 10, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not all of us drive not the to brag, way but you do. I could probably bang it out in 10, but, you know, still. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so they're in this hotel room in Texas. Uh They then cross the bridge over the border into Matamoros, Mexico. Okay. Matamoros at the time was a massive spring break destination. An estimated Uh 15,000 American tourists had descended on the city, and they were being catered to with things like margarita drink specials and tan line contests. Okay. The things we were into in college. Seriously. That night, the four friends partied until around 2.30 a.m. and then returned to their hotel without incident. So this is all in the same night. Okay. So far, so good. It's kind of (laughs) chill. So far. Oh, God. The next day, they went to the beach during the day and planned to have a similar evening of partying with fellow spring breakers, tan lines, margarita specials, etc. And at first, they did. But when it came time to head back home, things took a turn for the terrifying. Oh, no. The four young men were on their way back to the car when they stopped to pee. The next never, thing they... Never pee. <laughs> this never is meet a, a man, never, never pee. Never meet a man and never pee. <laughs> it's my advice. The next thing they knew, Mark was nowhere to be found. Oh, shit. After spending some time searching the streets for their friend, Bill, Brad, and Brent decided that he must have either met up with someone and gone to another bar or just went back to the hotel without them. Right. So I don't know if they were just like peeing on the side of the road, like in a rural must, area, or they like they stopped at a like a gas oh, station or something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So Bill, Brad, and Brent went back to the hotel and fell asleep. But when Mark was still not there when they woke up the next morning, their concern turned to panic. They called the police to report their friend missing and tried to piece together their fuzzy memories of when exactly they had last seen Mark. Because again, you're out partying. Right. You're drinking. Your timeline's going to get all foggy. Yeah, exactly. I get it. 
one of them remembered Mark stopping to talk to a woman from the tan line contest. Mm, hot. <laughs> As they made their way back to the car, while another remembered a Hispanic man with a scar on his face approaching Mark and saying something along the lines of, didn't I just see you somewhere or where did I last see you? Mm. Some sort of like inquisition. Mm -hmm. Neither recollection provided much to go on. And besides, police were not initially very concerned about Mark's disappearance, probably because like college boys, spring break, he probably just got yeah. drunk and went home with someone. and Right. And it's. You know, that's the, not in the age of cell phones. Right, so. right, right. How are you going to even really vet this? Yeah, so the cops were like, mm, okay. Mm. It probably also didn't help that half of this shit happened in Mexico and half of it happened in Texas. Yeah, that's tough. Mm -hmm. College students who had been reported missing from Matamoros in the past would often turn up within a day or two, usually with hangovers, but essentially unharmed. Yeah, it kind of sounds like a Tijuana adjacent situation absolutely like you can go right over the border you get hammered it's like a it's and like then you a, can go home yeah and then you just go home the next day it's like a bachelor paradise yeah or even just like a like paradise. a fucking friday night thing for people who live close yep. to there they, i'm yeah. sure the cops deal with that shit all the time mm -hmm. but as the days passed with no sign of mark it became to seem more likely that something more sinister had occurred mm-hmm his parents distributed 20,000 leaflets in the area and offered a $15,000 reward for any information leading to the recovery of their son. Oh, dear. It would not be discovered to what happened to Mark until a month after his disappearance, and the truth was far worse than uh, anything his loved ones could have possibly imagined in their worst nightmares. Oh, God. So I actually do know what happened to this guy, and it's really ugly, so buckle up. Oh, the discovery of Mark's whereabouts came about almost accidentally. On the afternoon of April, uh, this says April 1st. <laughs> I think Nailed it's it. April 11th. <laughs> okay. Mexican police had set up a routine roadblock as part of their ongoing drug enforcement operations. When a car blew through the roadblock at a high speed, they chased it, followed it to a ranch property outside of Matamoros called the Santa Elena. It's okay. the name of the property. Suspecting that the ranch was being used by a drug cartel, they decided to gather more information rather than going in immediately and risk getting, like, ambushed. Okay. They learned that the driver of the car who had blown through the roadblock was 20-year-old Serafin Hernandez Garcia, the nephew of Elio Hernandez Garcia, a local drug kingpin. Mm. So this was like a protected cartel person. Mm -hmm. Police raided the ranch on April 9th. Oh, okay. So that was probably April 1st then yeah. when he blew through. April April 1st. Okay. Got and it. Police raided the ranch on April 9th and discovered 75 pounds of marijuana. That's a lot of marijuana. It's an awful lot of marijuana. Yeah. They arrested Seraphin, Elio, and three others, including the ranch's caretaker. As it was suspected that the drug cartel had been involved with Mark Kilroy's disappearance, the prisoners were questioned about Mark. Uh-huh. When shown Mark's photograph, the ranch's caretaker told police that he did indeed recognize him and that he had seen him on the ranch handcuffed in the back of an SUV. Uh-oh. That's not good. Not great. You don't want to be handcuffed by the cartel. You don't want to be handcuffed in the back of an SUV. Period. Full stop. You just don't. <laughs> you don't want to be handcuffed. Well, no. some people well, do. <laughs> that's <what it> depends. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Under interrogation. God, we're fucking losers. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of Corey's friends, like, moonlights as a bounty hunter, and he has a pair of real handcuffs. And he, yeah. And he put them on me, and I just pulled my wrist out because I have such baby hands. They're so teensy. And he was like, oh. Wow, well, these do are I need useless. A child's handcuffs to deal with people like you? I was like, Probably. maybe. Probably. It didn't even hurt that bad. I just pulled him out. Oh, God. Anyway, perks of having really dainty <sighs> wrists. Tiny bird wrists. <laughs> I can't be contained. I can't. No one puts <laughs> tiny wrists in a corner. In a corner. <laughs> so fucking dumb. Okay. Under <sighs> interrogation, Serafin Hernandez Garcia and Elio Hernandez Garcia, so the, the, the son and the uncle, mm -hmm. admitted that they had kidnapped and ritually sacrificed Oof. Mark Kilroy. Oh, no. Seraphin told police he had been the one to bury Kilroy's body. Ooh. 
police also learned during these interrogations that Kilroy had been had only been one of many people killed on the ranch in the preceding months, all supposedly on the orders of a man named Adolfo Constanzo, who was a drug trafficker who had been operating a cult from the ranch property and instructing the Hernandez family and their associates to carry out human sacrifices in order to ensure success in their drug deals and protection from the police. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I've heard of this guy. I think we've covered him before in a live show. I don't know if we have. I feel like he's in, uh, there's a book we got, I think from Spotify for one of our the podcast one? buddies. Yes, I think that they talk about this guy mm. in that book because I vaguely remember reading about this. and I yeah. read it a while back, so... It's, it's possible that it's in, from in there. It's really fucking ugly. Yeah, it's gnarly. Uh, I will get to some points that will jog your memory. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So uh. Costanzo, along with his devoted disciple and sometimes second in command, a 24-year-old college student named Sarah Aldrete, Aldrete mm. had managed to flee the ranch. Mm. Police transported their prisoners back to the ranch and ordered them at gunpoint to dig up the bodies they had buried. Ooh. In total, there were 15 people buried in shallow graves on the property. Holy shit, that's a lot of people. They had either been burned, shot, (gasps) or hacked to death with a machete. Oh, my God. This is a Kenyan case. Jesus Christ. Yeah, that is. That's a lot. Gets worse. Just from a cursory scan of the rest of these notes. Good, 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 good stuff. Yeah. Sarah Finn Hernandez located Kilroy's grave by a piece of wire sticking out of the ground. <gasps> he explained to police that the other end of the wire had been had been attached to Kilroy's spinal column oh. so that it would be easy to pull his vertebrae out of the <gasps> ground after his body decomposed to make into a necklace. Oh, my God. Or earrings. <laughs> no, Lucy. I just got done showing off my mandible earrings. I had to. (laughs) Holy shit. That's so fucking bad. When the police commander noticed that Kilroy's legs had been chopped off, he inquired uh, if this had also been for some ritualistic purpose. Seraphin stated that no, it had simply made him easier to bury. (gasps) Oh, this is making me like want to borf. Mm -hmm. Even more gruesome discoveries followed. Take a deep breath. Great. Kilroy had had his heart torn out and his brains removed, the remains of which were later found boiled in a pot alongside a turtle Uh, inside a shack on the property that was determined to have been the site of the murders and ensuing ceremonies. uh uh This uh ritualistic pot, also known as a ganga, ganga, Uh or a blood cauldron in the religion. They definitely covered this in that cult book. Yeah. It's it's nuts. Mm-hmm. In the religion of Paulo Mayombe, which Adolfo Costanzo practiced a really perverted version of. Mm-hmm. Costanzo, who was of Cuban descent and grew up in Miami, reportedly began practicing Paulo Mayombe as a teenager after his mother remarried a man who was a practitioner as well as a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. So this is when the two kind of married, like, you know, those two meshed. Yeah. Yeah. As a young man, Costanzo had moved to Mexico City where he set up a profitable business casting spells for good luck that involved mm-hmm. animal sacrifice. And he read people's, like, uh, fortunes. Yeah. That I know from the book. So, like, he made tons of money doing that. hmm And then, like, also used these skills to manipulate people into doing what he said. He was such a creepy cult leader. So creepy. Yeah. It seems like he just practiced a lot of... I don't know if you'd really call it witchcraft, but a lot of right. like ritualistic ceremonies. Well, right. But he was like a fucking charlatan. Like he knew he was using. Oh, of course. Yeah, he was using these traditions to manipulate people for his own personal gain, and he made a huge. He went way up in the ranks in the cartel. It was I mean, nuts. he's also a drug dealer. He's also yeah. a cold blooded murderer. He's doing it for money because yes. he's making a fuck ton of money and selling drugs. Is of what he's doing. Yeah. So of course. Yeah. So many of his clients were reportedly wealthy drug dealers and corrupt politicians who enjoyed the violence of his displays. Mm -hmm. Costanzo became involved with drug trafficking himself and attracted loyal followers, 
aligning himself with the Hernandez family at Santa Elena, so that's the property, and escalating from animal sacrifice to human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. It would later be discovered that Costanzo had already started practicing human sacrifices before leaving Mexico City, but it had escaped notice because his victims were sex workers, homeless people, and low-level drug dealers. They just didn't yep. notice and or care. Yep. Following the revelations, so fucking tragic. I know. Following the revelations of what had gone on at Santa at the Santa Elena Ranch, a massive manhunt was launched for Costanzo and his associates. Police finally closed in on him in a Mexico City apartment on May sixth. An intense gun battle ensued, mm -hmm. during which Costanzo ordered one of his followers, a man who went by El Duby, to shoot him before police could capture him. Mm -hmm. When police finally succeeded in storming the apartment, Casanza was dead. Five of his followers, including Sarah Aldrete, Aldrete, this was like mm. his right hand person, yeah, was arrested at the scene. Several other of his followers who were believed to have been involved in human sacrifices were arrested in Mexico City later that day. Mm -hmm. So they they did a pretty good job at cutting the head off the snake in a pretty quick, right. quick way. But once yeah. once things started to get rolling. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's unfortunate, but also not surprising that it took the death of an American to put the pressure right. on the police enough to actually solve these crimes. Yep. So, And he'd been going back and forth between, like, Mexico, Miami, and Texas for years. Yeah. Fucking dealing drugs. And, I mean, it's like this guy did a lot of damage. And you know that there are murders that are not attributed to him that were oh, him. I wouldn't be surprised at all. And yeah. people were doing all kinds of crazy shit for him. And he had so many higher level government officials in his pocket. It was so fucking nuts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He got away with literal murder for so long. Yeah. So the many people arrested in connection with Kilroy's death and the other murders carried out by Costanza's cult were given prison sentences ranging from 30 to 60 years. Mm -hmm. Which, like, why stop at 60? You, right. These are horrific I know these folks are definitely a danger to society. I don't know. I and I I don't know how old they were when they went into prison. So it might be long enough, and I don't know how the Mexican pr Mexican courts work. But right. it just it, I don't know. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is so much so much widespread violence. I know, and so much loss of life. I know. But it's like sixty years at the most. Really, it just doesn't. Yeah, it, it never feels like enough. Yeah. So the shack that had been the site of the human sacrifices was doused in gasoline and burned to the ground by police. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so thanks. <laughs> thanks, Kenya. Dina. That's, that's actually <laughs> Dina's fan pick. Holy oh, shit. classic. Classic. God damn it. And if you haven't read that Colts book, Dina, read it because it's great. And it's... it gives a great in-depth look at this case. Yeah, yeah. It's really wild. And this guy was also bisexual, so he he would sleep with people, specifically men, like young men, to bring them into, like, his harem. Like it's even he just more had, manipulation. Yeah, he just had so much control. And he was a total sociopath. Like, he did not feel connection to these people. Yeah. He was literally just doing it for his own gain. It was, this guy was nuts. I'm going to go the back book. and it's read so that. It's so good. Yeah, it's so yeah. good. Because well there's, done. like, multiple different cults in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Each section is a different... I can't believe I just said multiple cult. different. You know what I mean. <laughs> I know what you mean, girl. I know what you mean. I don't love not, but like being redundant. <laughs> but like, could you find his arm? <laughs> if, you like if you looked hard look enough? Hard enough? <laughs> if you dig deep enough? <laughs> oh, my God. I'll never live it down. Okay. <laughs> Well done. And should we hear another quick word from our sponsors and then get to my case? Let's do it. All right. <laughs> Are you ready for my case? Yeah, baby. Uh, okay, this case is nuts. And <laughs> Actually, I you've been bragging about your case all day. So, yes, I'm ready for it. I'm excited. I think, I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarro. <laughs> but I found it very, very entertaining. And I just want to give a big shout out to just the internet. In general. <laughs> <laughs> because when I saw this topic, all I wanted was some, like, super old, salacious, sweaty Louisiana crime. And uh, by golly, did I ever get it. Yes. So we're going to hop into the way, way back machine and travel to New Orleans 
in the 1800s. Ooh. 1880s. Wow. Mostly. And the star of our tale, the star of our show, is a sassy young brothel owner named Kate Townsend, who is a farce to be reckoned with. Farce. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't need to like her. She's not a good person. Okay. But uh, we'll get to it. Anyway, <laughs> so she'd been road hard and put away wet at a young age, all right? She was born in Liverpool, England, and she came to the States around like 18 or 19 years old after being saddled with twins by a virile sailor named Peter who almost immediately abandoned her with the children, like went back to sea. Jesus! Yeah. God. So he returned like after the children were born and Kate allegedly popped off and started like a physical altercation with Peter who fought back, which was exactly what Kate allegedly wanted. And then so she went to the cops and he got six months in jail and I think would have been like granted a divorce. OK, so she was readily. trying to provoke. She wanted out of the relationship. She wanted out of all of it. Mm -hmm. And allegedly she provoked him. OK. It's not clear if she left England while Peter was in jail or after he got out of jail, but either way, she ditched Peter and her twins, <laughs> left the kids. Oh, come on. Uh, hey, hey, it's hard to be 18 or 19 with twins and just want to live your own oh, life. Yeah, I guess she was really young. Yeah. Like, can you super blame her? No. no that, me, that's no, a lot. Personally, yeah, that's absolutely a lot. Absolutely not. It's a lot to take on. Bye bye. Yeah, but later, I'm going to. Them go to the U.S. as she settled in New Orleans Perfect. in 1857. So she's young, she's unmarried, she's a woman. Well, she's divorced. Well, she's yeah, she's unmarried. Yeah, and so her ability to support herself is limited. Basically, your only option is like sex work or get married to someone who can support you. So she wasn't 1850s. married to the sailor. No, neither. I think she had been granted a divorce, or she just left him. But yeah, in the, okay. as far as as far as like the United States is concerned, she had like changed her last name. She is there as an unmarried, un untrodden woman. Got it. So she didn't have the Scarlet D. No, at this point, no. Okay. Her ability to support herself was super limited, and she did go into sex work and found herself under the employ of a brothel run by a woman named Clara Fisher. She remained there for about six months before moving on, first working like a beat on Canal Street, like she worked in different row houses mm -hmm. on that block, um, and then eventually went to work for another madam in a more established brothel, a woman named Maggie Thompson, and she stayed there for several years and was like doing really well and able to support herself. So in a time when body shaming was so overt that being a large woman with tig old bitties was literally seen as a deformity. A luscious deformity. Yeah, I know. God. But Kate, like, made a splash on the streets as an unapologetically large-breasted, full-figured woman. Oh, that's what you said when I said your boobs look really good today. Yep. Which they do. We'll get to it. Your deformities look amazing My deformity today. is really coming in <laughs> hot today. <laughs> yeah. Disgusting. So this is a quote about her from a newspaper from way back in the 1860s or 70s at this point. It says, quote, Kate was a very portly woman and attracted general attention on the street. <laughs> As she became older, she became afflicted with what was probably a deformity, a voluptuous bust which never failed to provoke astonishment in those who chanced to meet her. Okay, I smell some jealousy, but whatever. I smell some misogyny for sure. Well, yeah. But what the press called a deformity, her clients called a bonus, and she was consistently the most popular woman in the brothels that she worked in, and she saved a buttload of money. Eventually being able to leave Maggie Thompson's employ and open a brothel over. Sorry, tequila. Oh, my God. <laughs> How's it taste? So bad. <laughs> oh, OK. I'm fine. I'm recovering. You got this. I'm fine. So she opened a brothel of her own in 1863. An so entrepreneur. She, her. Yep. She is a boss bitch. Women helping women. Love it. Love it. Love it. Her place was the fucking Ritz Carlton of brothels. Yes. Like, decked out floor-to-ceiling velvet, like, fancy lighting and sconces. sconces. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Why did we yeah. both just say that? 
we can picture a brothel. Chandeliers. Oh, uh, yeah. It was sweeping like staircases. Tons, tons of money went into this place. Nice. Lots and of like had, maroon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And she had clients who were political higher ups and also in law enforcement. So she was able to use. <laughs> Every single one of those connections to build the most lavish and exclusive brothel in New Orleans. So she also took a lover around this time, a man named Troival or Billy Egbert Sykes. Let's go with Billy. <laughs> yeah. Troival. Troival Redenbacher. Billy Sykes. <laughs> So Billy kept like kind of came to her at a time when he was sort of down on his luck. And like it wasn't uncommon in brothels for brothels to also rent rooms for like just to like do wayward dudes, basically. Regular so like, rooms, right, no sex so he, rooms. Right. And then, you know, you're just kind of on site for, you know, whatever. Sex. So he was renting a room there and then started working for her as a bookkeeper and, like, handled a lot of the business side of things because Kate allegedly couldn't read or write, which kind of makes sense. Like, she has twins in England in the early 1800s yeah. at the age of 17, basically, and then flees to the United States. Like, she's well, not, she didn't go to school. If she didn't come up with any money, then why, why would she be able to right. read or write? Yeah. For the better part of a decade, she thrived running her own brothel. She's like catering to the wealthy and political elite and just living it up. But political reigns come to an end and like a bunch of the high status clients who used to frequent her establishment began to move on. Like maybe they were out of office and, you know, whatever, retiring, etc. Mm -hmm. So long story short, business is dwindling. And Kate then decided, like, okay, the only way to get people in here is by lowering my standards. I got to lower my prices and start letting in men of lesser wealth and status to just, like, pay the bills. You got to do what you got to do. Got to do what you got to do. And this definitely worked. Like, some articles I read said that there was a time when she was, ma like, making as much money doing it that way as she was when she was only catering to the wealthy elite. Mm-hmm. But it was at the extent of, expense of, like, her general happiness, because when you bring in the riffraff, shit's going to go down in your establishment. Yeah. So she was kind of hardened by the uptick in nonsense going down in her brothel. Mm. She had a, And she had a raw temper on her. Oh. So one bout of nonsense that happened at her a brothel ended in murder. In 1870, a regular customer by the name of Gus Taney came into the brothel to enjoy some gambling and merriment and, of course, sex. 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 <laughs> he was joined by another patron who, like, wasn't friends with him, but, like, sat at the table, probably, where they were gambling. This guy, Jim White, who was there of his own accord to enjoy the same exploits as Gus. So Gus ordered a bottle of wine to enjoy, and when the bottle arrived, he was charged, like, you know, by today's standards, like, ten bucks for it. Unfortunately, Gus only had about 250 left on him and he couldn't afford the wine. Jim, the guy who was sitting near him, made some like snide remark about how Gus couldn't afford the wine and this like set Gus the fuck off because they're also drunk at this point. Oh, yeah. So he's like, fuck you, don't make, don't make fun of me crying. <laughs> so Gus starts yelling that he did have the money when he ordered the wine and that Jim must have stolen cash out of his pocket. Oh, okay. And Jim, oh, yay, yeah, guy. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Gus. Jim did not like this accusation and lunged at Gus. Gus pulled a revolver out of his pocket, pointed it right at Jim, but quicker and likely less drunk than Gus, Jim pulled a knife from his own pocket and proceeded to stab Gus in the chest, piercing his heart and killing him. Oh, my God. Yeah. That escalated really quickly. Real quick. <laughs> Meanwhile, fucking Kate is just like, uh, what the fuck is going on here? Both of you out. Get out. <laughs> no, nope, he's bleeding all over your fucking brothel. Don't care. Get out. You're ruining my crushed velvet sofa. Yeah. Can you imagine? You can't get all that blood out of crushed velvet. No. Game over. You got to toss that whole fucking thing. Ugh. Legend has it. The cops who, as we remember, many of whom were clients of Kate's, gave her <laughs> both the revolver and the knife used in the murder after the case was closed to keep his like macabre souvenirs. Oh my God. 
I would put them in a shadow box so fucking fast. Well, I don't know what she did with the gun, but the legend also states that Kate carried that knife with her at all times, even slept with it under her pillow at night. Oh my God, how romantic. So romantic. So <laughs> back to Bill Sykes. This is Kate's lover and sort of business manager. Ah, uh, yes. Kate and Bill had an on again, off again, and somewhat, I'm so scared to burp. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It keeps coming up. I'm fine. And somewhat volatile relationship over the course of like the 25 years that they were hanging out. (laughs) Hanging out. Hanging out. A casual hang. I mean, they were, by all accounts, they were married, but they were not actually legally married, but they like lived together, worked together, and were together on and off for all these years. Like a domestic partnership. Yeah, but that like wasn't even a thing in the late 1800s. But conceptually. Right. Exactly. So... According to reports, and these reports that we have to kind of see through a lens of heavy misogyny, but also we have to remember and affirm that women can be abusive partners as well. Absolutely. So the the volatility of their relationship was like she was the aggressor in 90% of it. Some reports indicate that Kate became very possessive of Bill, essentially turning their relationship into like indentured servitude with strict rules and demands for Bill to obey. And when he didn't, Kate would become violent, allegedly even cutting off one of his toes when he refused her. (laughs) Not great. And poor, yeah. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Poor Bill also likely had some Stockholm syndrome because Kate would have like relations with other men. And Bill would get extremely jealous. Well, she was a sex worker. Well, he yeah. Knew what he was signing up for. But her. I think she also had like boyfriends, like oh. outside of her emotional job. Well, attachments. Well, at that point, she's the madam. So she's not even taking clients in that way anymore. Yeah, but if they've been together for 25 years. He, yeah, then and, she and, was uh, certainly it, taking clients. If it's just sex. Right. Like. There's just he a lot knew what it. he was signing up for, but if it's if it's there's boyfriends, a lot of issues in this relationship. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I yeah, I'm not even gonna try to it's parse not, what the fuck's going on here. It's not good, and no. I also believe that there was some violence on both sides mm. in in this relationship, and that's not to say that doesn't like you know reverse the harm. It just compounds it. Like there's just a lot of violence in this relationship. Yeah, so. One of these men that she was having a relationship with went by McClern. I think that was just his last name, and that's how it showed up in reports. I never saw first name. Okay. The two struck up a romance around 1883 when he came into her brothel also looking for a room to rent. Bill was soups not into this and wanted to kick this guy out of the house because they started hooking up. But Kate refused to kick him out, and instead both her and McClern ganged up on Bill and, like, beat the shit out of him. Kate was pissed that Bill was getting in the way of her affairs and complained to a friend that she wanted to kill him. Her friend, a woman named Molly, attempted to talk her out of this, and the two went out for a drink. Like, that's a good friend right there. Molly's like, you don't want to kill your pseudo-husband. Don't kill your husband. Just Let's come out go for get a, a drink. Like yep. Cosmo with Let's a Let's go have a Cosmo and talk about it. Let's go to the tavern. You don't have to go down this road. So the two were getting a little drunk when McClern showed up at the bar and started shit with Kate. He broke a champagne bottle and threatened her with it, and she pulled her trusty knife from her bosom and threatened him right back, and he the backed knife. down. The, the knife. knife. She's got a knife. <laughs> so he backed down, but allegedly Kate was so fired up, and she said, quote, I gotta cut somebody. <laughs> <laughs> it's like she was just blue-balled for the violence. Yes. She's like, I, got, I, I, I gotta I, cut somebody. I have to cut somebody. I can't do this. <laughs> So I've she got the knife out. What am I supposed to out. do now? Put it it's away? It's fucking out. Yeah. I can't go back now. <laughs> so she headed home to confront Bill, who was back at the house. Oh, good. Molly, the good friend. Molly deserves an, uh, like some kind of award. <laughs> an Oscar for trying to be a, a good Nobel friend. A Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> yeah. She managed to like beat Kate home and warn Bill that Kate was on a rampage. And like Bill was like, oh, fuck. And he locked himself in his room. Kate did the same thing in her own room and allegedly slept off a hangover for about three days. Been there. (laughs) This is 30. Yeah. (laughs) So a few days after the altercation, when he thought everyone had sobered up, calmed down, Bill goes to Kate's room to talk. Shortly after, the housekeeper hears screams coming from Kate's bedroom and runs to see what's wrong and finds Bill and Kate fighting. 
I think the housekeeper kind of like ran in to try and break it up and Bill pushed her out of the room and locked the door. So this leaves the housekeeper, I think her name was Mary, in the hallway, just like listening to the commotion that's continuing inside of this room. Oh my God, that'd be horrible. Yeah, really stressful. So about 10 minutes later, the door opens again and there's Bill in the doorway, like cut, clothes torn to shreds. He's bleeding. He's got blood all over him. That's clearly not from his own wounds. And Kate is bloody on the floor behind him. Uh Uh-oh. Dead Dead as our doornail. Oh, she's dead. She was the oldest living Lutheran, but now she's dead as a doornail. Killed with her own ex-lover's knife. Yeah. So police were called and Bill waited at the scene patiently to be apprehended. Like he knew there was a witness. He knew what he was getting. So at trial, he swore that he killed Kate in self-defense. Easily provable, I would think. Yeah, I mean, it's also the late 1800s, but it's still fairly provable. And I actually kind of believe his story, given the circumstances, but, like, it's all bad. Yeah. So according to him, the two were fighting, and she pulled the knife that she kept under her pillow on him. So they were in Kate's bedroom. They were in Kate's bedroom. He confronted her about like McLaren or whatever, yeah. her their their altercation from a few nights before. She's like, fuck off, I'm still hungover. Slash, slash, slash. Probably. Well, she had come home drunk from the bar wanting to kill him, and now he's like, bitch, mm-hmm. what the fuck was that all about? And she is probably like, well, I never got to cut anybody. I still want to do it. Pulls <laughs> the, pil- the fucking knife out from under the pillow. He manages Ooh, to wrestle the knife God. away from her, but then she grabbed a big-ass pair of sewing shears... And goes after him again. She's got, like, scissors in her room. From the bay after you cut off your own hair? Probably. (laughs) So his torn up clothes that, like, the housekeeper was able to confirm and also wounds on, like, his face and hands did support that he was attacked or something sharp. Mm -hmm. When she came at him with the scissors and wouldn't stop, he stabbed her. So he ended up stabbing her 11 times to get her, like, get, get the fuck off of me. He's just, like, jabbing at her. Yeah. He was acquitted of all charges at trial, and in an interesting twist, he had also been named as the recipient of Kate's estate in her will, because they'd been together for, like, 25 fucking years. Uh Uh-oh. And he was not, you know, convicted of murder, and so he still was able to get her estate, which was, like, pretty fucking big. (laughs) Well, she owned that whole Ritz Carlton brothel. Yeah, so this is a quote I'll finish out with this. From uh, familyresearch.org, somebody through, like, Ancestry, like, wrote a a blog about this woman, basically. They said, quote, it was amended, the will, to probate with Bill Sykes as the executor, but he was removed in February of 1884 for pocketing money that was supposed to go to the estate. So if he hadn't fucked up and, like, gotten greedy and taken more than was actually allocated to him, he would have probably, yeah, had a pretty good living to carry him out for a while. Oh, no. At the time, the state attorney general asked the courts to reduce Bill's claim to Kate's money to only 10% of the entire estate since he and Kate lived together but had never been married, and that was a law that was in force at the time. Bill Sykes fought the judgment against him in every court in Louisiana but eventually lost. The estate was settled in 1888, and by the time the state managed to steal everything good from the estate, it was valued at only $33,142.65 of which the lawyers got about 30000 to pay themselves, and the rest went to the court costs and other expenses. In the end, Bill Sykes, Kate's killer, ended up with $34. <laughs> from the Enough to pay for that wine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's my case. 34 bucks. <laughs> Can you believe? Oh, my God. Well, if we were to believe him, it's not like he killed her for her money. Right. No, he didn't. He killed her because she was attacking him with scissors and had threatened <laughs> to basically cut him open three days prior in a drunken rage. $34. I gotta stab somebody. <laughs> I won't wow, rest. that's amazing. Yeah. Is that nuts? Nice job. Thank you. It's also so old that like a lot of it's probably folklore by now, but I was Doesn't matter. I'll take in. it. Who gives a fuck? Who gives a fuck? I love it. Who gives it. a fuck? I love it so much. Oh. So thank you. Well, good job to you. And thank you also to Dina Della Serda. Oh, God This was bless. a fun topic. 
So fun. We didn't do as many Southern accents as I was anticipating. Well, after the absolutely abominable pairing that Dina forced (laughs) down my throat, I really had the gummy that I took. I had to force myself to concentrate hard enough just to read. And the thought of also (laughs) concentrating on an accent was a little too much for old Mandy. I had a lot on my plate. I had so much. I am. (laughs) I am encumbered. I am encumbered, y'all. Well, we better go because we need to fly to Virginia to look for that arm. Yes, we do. We got (laughs) digging to do. (laughs) All right. Thank you for joining us this week. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Wine and Crime. Our cover art is by Kala Yip. Music by Phil Young and Corey Wendell. Editing by Jonathan Camp. Check out our website and blog at wineandcrimepodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at wineandcrimepod. If you have questions, answers, or recommendations to share, email us at wineandcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Episodes are available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, basically wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And if you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. It is the best way to spread the word. If you'd like to show your support, visit our Patreon page to keep this podcast and the wine flowing. Cheers! Tis the season for chicken fingers at Raising Cane's. Warm up with hand-battered, cooked-to-order chicken fingers, crispy, crinkle-cut fries, garlicky, buttered Texas toast, and the real source of holiday magic, cane sauce. And while you're treating yourself, don't forget to treat everyone on your list to Cane's gift cards and New York City-inspired plush puppies that benefit pet organizations. Happy holidays from Raising Cane's Chicken Fingers. One love. (laughs) 